This is Mark Lieberman, the host of The World According to Mark on WPVM Radio in Asheville, North Carolina, um, 103.7 FM and streaming on WPVMFM.org. The uh, guest today is a woman I met while I was strolling around Nashville and I saw something that said Black Mountain College Museum Art Center. And I thought that was a pretty interesting combination of words. And I didn't know what to think, but I met um, Kate Averett, who is the outreach manager for Black Mountain College Museum Art Center. And we looked around at the exhibit and we got very interested in, because it has a very interesting and a long and unusual history, I guess, and a mission which is um, vibrant today and um, responds in some ways to a lot of other currents of social issues, art, policy, all the things that make um, Asheville interesting. And I guess it made Black Mountain interesting. So let me introduce my guest, Kate. Thank you for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about Black Mountain College. Well, we're going to talk about Black Mountain College, and then we're going to talk about Black Mountain <laughs> College Museum and explain why those two things go together. But um, why don't we start, I guess, from sort of the mission of uh, the museum and then talk a little bit about the college. And obviously, they're inextricable. So. What is what is this Black Mountain College Museum thing about? Yeah, so Black Mountain College existed from 1933 to 1957. And of course, Black Mountain, which is a small village in Western North Carolina. Um, and its history is one that has really taken a foothold internationally and in major cultural centers. Um, and from 1957, when the college closed up until 1993 when we were founded. It's a history that has been present in Western North Carolina, but hasn't been put at the forefront. Um, so actually our founder, Mary Holden, grew up in Western North Carolina. She grew up in Swannanoa, um, very closely related to Warren Wilson College. Um, and she wasn't really aware of Black Mountain College until she moved to Paris. Um, and then she started hearing about it. And so she's like, she comes back, she's like, why was this not something that was really prevalently spoken about in our region? It's this incredible history right here. And so we were founded in 1993 in an effort to preserve that history um, and work with alumni and faculty who were still with us to gather oral, oral histories, to build a collection, um, to really preserve that. Um, and also with input from alumni and faculty, the decision was made to also, and this is where our arts center aspect of what we are comes in, um, is to be a living, uh, living organization that promotes innovative work happening today, um, that connects artists who are in the Black Mountain legacy back with this history. Um, and so that's kind of our mission is that twofold approach of preserving the history and then extending the legacy and drawing in those artists that are kind of in the Black Mountain tradition today. Well, let's talk about um, the history of predating the museum, but going back to the college itself. The college was founded in 1933. Um, that's an interesting date for those of you who are uh, history buffs, I guess might be the right word. Um, that happened to be um, a date that was um, important in the rise of Nazism, the Nazi party in Germany. And from my reading, tell me if I'm pronouncing this correctly, there was a college in Germany referred to as the Bauhaus. Um, and it was uh, considered at the time a very influential modernist art school uh, of the time, um, but it attracted um, negative attention from the Nazis. They uh, um, made a lot of assertions about uh, what they were teaching and who were there and, and the words foreigners and Jews and all of that came up. And it was a, a maverick school 
in the sense of it had a lot of new ideas, uh, not just about art, but how a university or school should be structured. And apparently um, it was uh, considered to be on the hit and needed to be on the hit list for the Nazis taking over after the uh, short democratic period of the Weimar Republic in Germany and it closed. And, and I think I've got that right, but can you tell us, uh, Kate, how that uh, led ultimately to the creation of another innovative college um, across the ocean? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting concurrent history. Um, Black Mountain College was originally founded by a group of faculty members from Rollins College in Florida. Um, this was, you think about what's happening in the Weimar Republic in Germany, there's this incredible um, bohemian spirit, this um, spirit of innovation that followed World War I of, you know, and I think this is something that was global at this time is, okay, the world as we know it is over. How do we build a new world? Um, and the Bauhaus was very much in tune with that. Um, but at the same time, across the globe, there was this progressive education movement. Um, and Rollins College in Florida uh, brought on a group of faculty members as part of that progressive education movement. Um, and we kind of joked that they were a little too progressive for Rollins. Um, their John Andrew Rice, who was one of those faculty members, was uh, famously extremely difficult to work with um, and um, really experimental um, in his approaches, but really had this incredible connection with students and with other faculty members. Um, but for a number of reasons um, was ousted from Rollins College in a major scandal. Um, and so he, when he was ousted from Rollins and a group of other faculty members um, who were brought on for this progressive education, um, decided, well, okay, if we can't fit within this system, then let's build our own school. Um, and this was all based on John Dewey's principles of education. And one major tenet of that is that arts should be central to education, especially hands-on learning through art and through creativity. Uh, the only problem was that they weren't artists. Um, so the question then comes in, who leads the art program and who is, um, who's carrying this forth at the college? And at that same time, Joseph and Ani Albers, who were instructors at the Bauhaus, were forced to flee Germany when the Bauhaus closed. Ani was, um, was Jewish, and um, for that, amongst their standing as intellectuals, were forced to leave Germany and had arrived in New York. Um, so they were connected with uh, John Andrew Rice, who wrote to Joseph Albers and said, you know, we want to bring the Bauhaus um, idea and everything you've been doing to Black Mountain College. Um, would you be willing to lead our art program? And Yosef Albers wrote back, you know, I, I speak very little English, will that be a problem? And uh, Johnny DeRay says, not at all. And they come up and lead the art program. And because of their influence, their global network and connections, um, along with many other faculty members that came in, it became this lightning rod for the most innovative thinkers of that time period. Um, yeah, so it's, it was really synchronicity at work. And it was artists, but not, quote, just artists in the traditional sense. Um, I looked over the roster, uh, which is very extensive, of some of the faculty at the time. Uh, the only two names that jumped out at me, not being uh, the student of this, was Buckminster Fuller and John Cage. Mm -hmm. John Cage being... Um, a very innovative uh, composer of uh, dissonant music, I guess is one way of describing it. And Buckminster Fuller, best known for the geodesic dome. But it, apparently, um, Black Mountain College attracted a lot of a lot of th those types, not just people who were free thinking, but people who um, were very influential in terms of some of these modernist movements. How was how were they able to do that? Yeah, I think Black Mountain was an exciting place for a lot of people to come because you could kind of leave the confines of major art centers, um, places like New York and say, okay, if I come down, I have some room to play here and I have room to collaborate um, in this kind of interdisciplinary approach. And a big part of that was the summer art institutes uh, that Albert started in the 1940s um, where 
you can imagine a lot of people might not be able to come and join full-time faculty. They had um, either positions elsewhere, people like Buckminster Fuller, uh, Walter Gropius, the founder of the Bauhaus, they were teaching at other universities around the United States, but they could take a few weeks over the summer and they could come down and teach seminars. Um, and the same thing with John Cage and Merce Cunningham who came down as visiting lecturers and performers and then came back as faculty members. Um, and it really was offering these opportunities for you to come down and know that you're going to be in the company of others who are interested in collaboration and working together towards an experimental goal. Um, and also a lot of discourse where I think people like John Cage came down and taught and there was a lot of butting heads between other faculty members. So it again opens up this dialogue, um, which is also so important to the history. Um, but those summer institutes in art, music, um, those became kind of these really iconic moments in Black Mountain College's history. Um, but I'm glad that you point out that there are multiple disciplines represented at Black Mountain College, because we always like to also point out that it wasn't an art school, it was a liberal arts school. Um, so there were also incredibly influential physicists, mathematicians, um, philosophers, historians, writers, um, of course, the poets have an enormous impact in the college as do craftspeople. Um, and so I think when you often look at the list of what I kind of call the heavy hitters, you'll usually see names like Robert Motherwell, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, um, but there are also, you know, it really is interesting where if anyone comes in, whether they're an engineer or an artist, there will be a name they come across and they go, oh, wow, this person was here. Um, and who were they studying with at that time? Um, and I think that's part of what made Black Mountain so special. Um, but one more thing that I want to point out, too, is a lot of these people uh, we now think of as so legendary. And at the time, they were um, they were students or they were unknown or they were struggling and didn't have two pennies to rub together. Um, and so it's always really cool to look back in retrospect of who was there. But at the time, um, a lot of these artists were struggling to find recognition for their work. Um, they just happened to find a place where they could really play and experiment. As you were talking about, um, about the, the college at the time and bringing together this uh, not famous, but nonetheless iconic class of people. It, it somehow reminded me of what I understood, but only vaguely about the Ch Chautauqua Society, which um, was in New York. And I think um, also uh, depended upon a heavy uh, concentration of programs in, um, in the summer uh, in, in New York. And I think there's Chautauqua societies, but in any event, um, so in one sense, um, Black Mountain College was unique, but it was, it, it basically uh, drew from the experience of this uh, German institution, which is a bit strange. Um, but there, you know, there were others that we talked uh, before we got on air about institutions that still endure as colleges and are considered to be uh, experimental, shall we say, like Antioch College and uh, Oberlin, two colleges I'm vaguely familiar with in Ohio. Um, so one of one thing I wanted to, to go into a little deeper is the this issue of democratization, which um, so it wasn't just that there were innovative new things, but the way Black Mountain College functioned as an organization. What, what what aspects of democratic you know democracy and all of that was present at the time if you can talk about that yeah absolutely um and that's also really deeply tied to john dewey um really if you're if you're looking into black mountain college john dewey gives a really great grounding because that really is the principles it was founded on um he described black mountain college as being a living example of democracy um and i think democracy is something where we often think about an ideal, um, but Black Mountain really is an example of democracy in practice, both in its failures and in its enormous successes. Um, but it was really based on this lack of hierarchy in principle between faculty and students. Um, so you 
really had an open line of communication with all of your instructors. You ate meals together. Um, in a lot of cases, you were cleaning dishes together. You were working the farm together. Um, all aspects of community life were shared amongst students and faculty. Um, there was also this Quaker idea of consensus was extremely important to the college. Um, so if a major decision was to be reached, consensus had to be reached by um, the faculty and um, the students who were representative um, within um, these kinds of conversations. And you can imagine how frustrating that could become if you have a group of extremely intelligent, strong-willed, um, radical thinkers coming together and trying to reach consensus. And that often meant that it would take years to um, enact certain changes. Um, one example of that is integration of the college. Um, you can imagine in the 30s when the college is being founded, uh, particularly by those who are fleeing oppression elsewhere. Um, you're founding a college in the Jim Crow South and segregation is so counterintuitive to Black Mountain College. And so this debate on whether or not to integrate the college goes on for 10 or 11 years before the decision is finally made to integrate. And that's still 10 years before Brown v. Board of Education, but it was an ongoing discussion. Um, and there were also times when consensus couldn't be reached. And there were times where half the faculty would become so frustrated with the way the college ran that they left and the entire community changed. Um, and that played a big part in the history of the college as well. But I think ideally it was this, um, this open discourse and this ability to talk through issues and to have both students and faculty heard on the issues that relate to the community. And that led to some really incredible things um, and really also gives, again, this example of what does, what does democracy look like in practice um, outside of the idealism that we often hold with it. Very interesting. Uh, those tuning in, this is Kate Averett, the Outreach Manager for Black Mountain uh, College Museum Art Center in Asheville. We're talking about the history of uh, Black Mountain College itself. And uh, just based upon what you said, Kate, a moment ago, I always find parallels about what's happened in the past and what's still happening. So here we are today in 2021 and um, one of the major issues that's coming into focus are uh, exemplified by words like critical race theory and uh, cancel culture and wokeness, a bunch of others. But there's, there's a huge uh, uh, amount of controversy over what can and should be taught in the schools and the extent to which uh, teaching about some of the bleaker aspects of American history, particularly centering around uh, African Americans who obviously were exploited as slaves and are still facing challenges. And all of the, all of the that seems to be discussed is should you should we have that? Shouldn't we have it? You know, what kinds of things should be taught? Should the government, uh, the state governments, for example, be involved in setting the agenda? I assume that if Black Mountain College were um, alive today, that they would be embroiled in the discussion about these issues as well. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Black Mountain College was since the beginning, I mean, before, before kind of colloquially we'd refer to the civil rights movement, they were involved with civil rights leaders um, and I think it all comes down to both the immediacy that they felt in that time period. Um, they understood what it meant to have history altered. Um, you're looking at World War II where the literal foundations of history and reality are being changed. Another thing that we've seen parallels with. Um, and so being an active participant in democracy, an active citizen in the world, which is what our current exhibition is looking at, that wasn't just um, based in principle, that was based in very immediate action. Um, and as you can imagine, was very important to them. So when they, when they were based in the South, there was an immediacy to understand what was going on um, with Jim Crow, to understand civil rights, to um, provide spaces for discourse on those issues. 
Um, and so one example of that is the precursors to the Freedom Riders came through uh, North Carolina. The only place they felt safe to stay was Black Mountain College. Um, and that was before Black Mountain integrated, um, but there were still discussions being had. Um, and another thing to point out there is just the, the importance of representation of who is on faculty, who is the student body. And again, this open dialogue where if you have representation across your student body, across faculty, and you have an open uh, discourse that is automatically going to lead to a more nuanced um, view of the world and view of education um, that you would get otherwise. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about all these things that we've, you know, these kind of legislating education at this level when it really is just human experience um, and being open to talking through human experience and bringing that into the educational system. Um, and that's something that was natural at Black Mountain College. Not to say it was a utopia by any means and that there wasn't discrimination because there was. Um, but I think that today, these kinds of discussions, um, Black Mountain would be at the forefront of just putting truth and discourse before dogma. Um, I think that was a big part of what they were doing. So if I can distill that um, and maybe put a slight spin on it, what we're saying is that any collection of people, even people who are considered to be radical or innovative, maybe a, a kinder word, doesn't mean that they will, quote, agree about which uh, radical or novel uh, ideas to pursue. But it does generally mean that there will be a dialogue about it, a conversation about it. And you use the word nuanced. Nuance uh, uh, is something that's um, unfortunately not often used in the way uh, things are discussed today that, you know, there, there's probably a, a nuanced discussion that could come about to talk about the so-called, for example, I'll use one critical race theory. Okay, maybe that, maybe that word sends people, uh, you know, going crazy. And what usually happens though is uh, yes to critical race theory or no to critical race theory. What you don't often hear about is, well, what is the central tenet that people that espouse the importance of critical race theory, what are they trying to, to accomplish? And is there a way to accomplish that which doesn't involve victimization or just blocking out the other side. And what I think you're saying is that would have resonated like that as, okay, let's talk about it. Let's even talk loudly about it, but let's not just call names of one another. Is that a fair statement? I think so. I mean, I'm also trying to, I think this central to Black Mountain College was tr the pursuit of truth. And part of the pursuit of truth is reckoning with the present day, reckoning with history, having multiple perspectives. Um, and so I think, but I think having, yes, having the ability to have a dialogue um, is extremely important as long as that dialogue is being held with the appropriate people at the table, which is something that Black Mountain pursued, but was never as successful at as they had hoped. Um, they were in touch with many historic Black universities in the hopes of increasing their uh, faculty and students of color. Um, but of course, there is also the issue of, as students and faculty of color, it's a dangerous place for them to be in the Jim Crow South. Um, people like Jacob Lawrence and Gwendolyn Knight Lawrence, they didn't leave campus, um, which is very understandable. Um, and but these, I, were, these were African Americans or blacks. Yes, these okay. were black. These were black faculty members um, who came in, um, and this was the first um, African American student um, who was Alma Stone Williams. Um, she came down. She was alone, and she, you know, it's this incredibly brave thing to come and be. She was the first African American student to integrate a school in the Jim Crow South, um, and so she came in, and her perspective, she talks about her perspective being very much valued, um, but she also talks about not being tokenized. She wasn't called upon to speak for the African American experience, um, but there were um, lecture series and opportunities where scholars who that is their focus and that was their mission and civil rights leaders um, came down and did speak on those issues. 
Um, so it's also, you know, it's just, it's trying to get as many people at the table as possible, which at Black Mountain was, um, was a goal that they were always pursuing. Well, let's, let's move on to Black Mountain. Um, uh, the college was closed in 1957. And then um, approximately uh, over 30 years later, um, the museum was founded. What can you tell us about why the college closed in 1957? And then more importantly, um, what took place between 57 and 93 that caused there to be a, a need and an interest to, um, to have this legacy institution, which is the museum itself? Mm -hmm. Um, so the short answer for why Black Mountain College closed is money. Um, they, and this plays into also how we came about, but they never had an endowment. Um, they never had a board because they wanted the freedom of not uh, working under a board. Um, they really were reliant upon student tuition. Um, and in the 1940s, uh, a lot of the late 1940s, it shifted to many students being there on the GI Bill. Um, and so the GI Bill really led to this ex extremely prosperous time in Black Mountain College's history. Um, also acknowledging that prior to that, when the college was predominantly female during wartime, it was prosperous in other ways, but it was a lower faculty, a lower student um, number than it became in the late 1940s, early 1950s. Um, and so they're relying on the GI Bill. And again, we talk about cycles of history. Um, we're leading into McCarthyism in the 1950s. Um, at the same time, we talked about these splits in faculty and these ongoing dialogues and the community changed every few years, um, new leadership, new emphasis. Um, and that in conjunction with the, pol the political change in the 1950s led to um, less and less students attending, uh, which led to less and less money which means they had to sell off the lower portion of the campus. They um, consolidated things. And we have um, an alum, uh, Jerry Vandewil, who was at the college in those later years. And he talks about, they would get their GI Bill money, throw it on the table and go, okay, this is what we have to work with. Um, and by the end, there are, I believe it was nine students and 12 members of faculty. It could be off um, there, but it had dwindled hugely. Um, but and, good faculty student ratio though. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Um, but there's a really, it's funny um, in retrospect, but there was an FBI investigation into Black Mountain College. Um, so the Veterans Administration uh, is starting to question like, should we be sending GI Bill money to this radical, radical, <laughs> you know, everyone there's a communist and they never wear shoes and this and that. Um, and so the FBI sends some agents to investigate the college. And it's funny because you think about, you know, there's this tight knit group of students and there's some FBI agents coming in, like they're not going to get noticed. Um, and students had so much fun with that. Um, but no one was ever formally charged um, there. Uh, John Ellison um, has done incredible work looking at FBI files on Black Mountain College and has written extensively on it. Um, and so I definitely encourage you to look into that. But out of this investigation came the Veterans Administration cutting funding to all students there in the GI Bill. So then they're left with nothing. And it really, the decision was made by Charles Olson, who was the final rector of the college to close the doors, sell the campus. and this kind of leads into the second part of your question. Um, so Olson has this diagram of what would happen to Black Mountain College after it closed. And it's kind of the central hub with spokes coming out of it, looking at poetry, music, performance, all of these different areas, and then connecting them to places like San Francisco, to New York, to a publishing wing, to the Jargon Society Press, to Black Mountain Review. Um, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here this, you might look at this diagram and see things very differently, but in theory, it's this idea of the college itself no longer exists, but the ideas do. And everyone who was touched by this thing and this experience carries that with them. And that had been happening since the very beginning. Um, but Olson kind of saw this opportunity, perhaps in a more formalized way than it came about to um, have Black Mountain have almost a, um, at least a national kind of wing in all of these different areas. And this is before social media. So that's pretty Yeah, amazing. exactly. <laughs> and there's people like Stan Vanderbeek, who's a Black Mountainer, who's imagining social media being a literal, like a, 
a dome you sit in and you have images put down from space like they're thinking big in a way that um that we often i think take for granted now um so there is this social network um that has existed from the beginning that continues that um is national international um people like john cage merce cunningham robert rauschenberg ray johnson i'm just throwing names out here they're all white men but <laughs> there's but many other that, that ultimately as you mentioned earlier became famous exactly after and, they left and they were in institutions and organizations of power where exactly and they were collaborating after they left black mountain and they took these ideas things like the happening um, which occurred at black mountain college that lay the groundwork for what we now consider to be performance art, which is so central to contemporary art as a whole. And the seed was planted at Black Mountain and then it sprouted across the world. Um, and so going back to what our place is in that is that these, these seeds were being planted everywhere and flourishing all over. Um, there was an awareness of this connection to Black Mountain College there, but it wasn't explicit. Um, in some cases it was, but quite a bit. It was kind of this thing we take for granted. Um, and in Western North Carolina, there wasn't there wasn't the sense of ownership over the Black Mountain College legacy that we have today. Um, I think that it was kind of seen as, well, these were people from outside who came in and then took everything elsewhere, which is a really limiting way of looking at Black Mountain history. I think it's so critical, which is funny because that conversation has changed now where everyone then asks us, is Asheville a creative hub because of Black Mountain College? You know, the conversation has shifted so much in the last close to 30 years. Uh, but that was part of the goal of our museum was a to say let's build a collection and exhibit work in context with one another because i always say any museum worth their salt is going to have black mountainers represented it's just it is so pervasive in american art and, and international art um, but showing those pieces in context with each other and drawing these relationships and bringing out these social networks and the way that you understand what was happening with these artists this time period, that is something that wasn't happening. There wasn't a collecting effort towards Black Mountain College. So that's what we started. And we very proudly have the largest collection in the world of Black Mountain College related artwork and ephemera. And um, we haven't touched on this, but we're a small museum. We have four members of staff. Um, this is the biggest we've ever been. Um, and this is the first time we've ever housed our collection on site and we're working towards um, presenting this work through uh, digitization, through access, um, all of these things. But it was so critical, especially when we had so many living alumni and faculty to collect their stories, to uh, collect their artwork, the artwork they traded with one another um, and give it context within the history of Black Mountain College. Um, and then again, going back to what we discussed in the beginning is then providing contemporary work in that context as well um, and saying this is something that is continuing beyond the closure of the college. Um, the doors have closed, but that doesn't mean that the legacy is ended. So four stalwart people are guiding the operations of the museum. And for those just tuning in, that was Kate Averett outreach manager of Black Mountain College Museum Art Center. Um, and you're obviously a dedicated staff. You do have an impressive and uh, diverse and large board and advisory board. Yes. So that helps, I guess, a lot in um, leadership and goal setting and things of that nature. But you're keeping the the legacy, I guess, uh, and the spirit of Black Mountain College alive through these various engagements. Um, I, I looked at something else on your site and, and the number is astonishing. Since 1993, it says you've had 200,000 engagements, 6,000 collaborations with artists, 51 exhibitions and 1,000 events. Um, so how is that possible? You'll have to, you'll have to explain <laughs> what all those numbers really mean. Yeah. So I think one way to explain that is we, programming is extremely important to us in a way that, um, 
I don't know if it's very different from other museums, but we kind of approach things differently where we, of course, present exhibitions that we hope um, bring in an incredible number of people who either are already familiar with Black Mountain and are excited to see a new story about it, do new waves telling it, or we have what we love is people coming up the street going, what is this? And we get to explain that to them. Um, and the numbers of people who come through our door to experience that is ever growing. And even through COVID and um, as we're coming out of COVID, we've been just amazed by the people who travel from places like Germany and Japan on this pilgrimage just to come to our museum in Asheville, North Carolina. It's incredible. Um, but in addition, they go there first before the Biltmore is what you're telling me. Yeah, I think we've got, you know, there's some, there's a Venn diagram of people who come to Asheville and where, you know, we have our Venn diagram. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's fascinating because it also helps people connect with that legacy here. Um, but as I was saying, programming is so important to us. So performance is hugely important to us. Uh, we present performances here in the museum. We present, we've worked with Diana Worthen Theater downtown to do larger scale performances with um, people like the Brooklyn Youth Chorus, uh, with uh, John Higginbotham and many others. We're excited to say we're bringing the Philip Glass Ensemble to the Black Mountain College um, campus at Lake Eden in 2022. Um, so performance both on a large scale and on a smaller scale of inviting um, innovative sound artists to come and perform in our gallery and do listening exercises. Um, all these things are so important to us and we really host an incredible amount of programs for a staff of four and for a small museum we always have. Um, and so those engagements come down to um, really this excitement over visiting our museum and being part of what we do, as well as um, our programs and performances and lecture series. Um, and we were talking before we went on the air about um, kind of our, our benchmark events, the things that really draw in. It gives us the opportunity to have as many people come together and talk about Black Mountain College as possible. Um, we have a conference every fall, the reviewing conference at, Black, at uh, UNC Asheville. Um, we've collaborated with them for 12 years now, um, and this upcoming conference will be on John Cage um, and looking at his global legacy, and that will be presented um, alongside an exhibition on John Cage and Buddhism. Um, and so all these, again, these conversations being had. Um, and then we also, again, going back to performance, um, part of the opening of that conference will be a new composition by John Luther Adams, the composer that we'll be bringing to Asheville and we'll have a world premiere in our museum. And again, it's this Black Mountain has this global influence and these incredible people who are still so dedicated to that history. And we have the opportunity to say, do you come to Asheville, North Carolina and present this? Um, and people are so excited to do that. Um, so it's, we're very, we're very privileged to be able to work within this sphere um, for that reason. Um, but the other, the other event that we're hosting, um, that we host every year, has been the Rehappening, uh, where we invite dozens of artists and performers to come out to the Lake Eden campus and present interdisciplinary, really challenging, uh, really, in some cases, very fun art and performance and installations um, where Black Mountain College was. We kind of imagine like a Saturday night at Black Mountain, which was famous for their parties. Um, and so we we bring that back every year. And that's where um, the Philip Glass Ensemble will be performing in the same space that the first happening occurred. Um, so there's all these, these points of resonance um, that we get to tap into that's really beautiful. And I think that the numbers of who's engaged with us is just a representation of how important this history is to so many people around the world. So give the date again as to when this ha happening. Or... Yes. So our conference is going to be November 12th through the 14th, if I have my dates right. I'm pulling up my calendar right now. And um, the rehappening we hold every spring, we are going to um, resume after a short, um, short hiatus for COVID, of course. Um, so the conference is November 12th through the 14th. And... The rehappening will be um, Saturday, April 2nd of 2022. Um, and we're excited to bring in, we have artists who have been raring to go for two years now with projects planned um, to 
let them loose on the campus and see what they do because I think it'll be it'll be a great kind of welcome back um, to that space. So we're really excited. This will be those events and our upcoming Faith and Arts um, Institute, which we're also hosting with UNC Asheville, um, are going to be great opportunities to kind of get back in person and get back into engagement with people um, on that scale again. So the, the physical um, presence at Lake Eden, uh, uh, we talked again before we got on there, there's there's an, uh, re that's been repurposed mm -hmm. and sold to a camp, mm -hmm. but what, what will people see physically in the environment, old buildings where this used to happen or that used to happen or what, what's that gonna look like? Yeah, um, so we're so grateful to Camp Rockmont who have been now at Lake Eden longer than it was Black Mountain College. Um, they bought the land in 1957 and have been there ever since and they use the buildings. Um, so the original Black Mountain College buildings at Lake Eden, uh, which the students and faculty lived in, the dorms, the dining hall, um, several areas where they held classes, those were actually originally built by E.W. Grove um, back uh, before it was ever Black Mountain College. Um, so those are still there and still used by the camp. But in addition to that, there are places like the Studies Building, which is this really iconic, modernist, international style building that students and faculty built. Um, that was, it hosted classes and then stu students had their each individual studies, which you could kind of think of as a studio. Um, and those were there and that is still standing and still used by the camp. And we're really excited because last October, there are two artworks that remain at the campus that we're aware of. We're always hoping to find something hidden in the closet somewhere. Uh, but there are two incredible frescoes on the base of the studies building by an artist, Jean Charlot, who is a contemporary of Diego Rivera and the Mexican muralist. Um, and these frescoes have been there um, since let's say 1944, if I have my date correct. Um, and last October, we were able to work with Camp Rockmont to conserve and um, restore them to a degree of legibility and preservation. Um, and it's really incredible to go and see them in that state. Um, so you will find all of the build, most of the buildings that were built by students and faculty, some have not lasted, but a good number of them have. Um, and then of course the landscape, which is beautiful and was so eye-opening to students and faculty who would come and just look out over the lake and see the Seven Sisters Mountains and um, hike on the grounds. And it just, it's a really incredible experience to go there and kind of immerse yourself in what they were immersed in when they were creating all this work. So the, the spring event, is that gonna be something which like, it's just you go from exhibit to exhibit or uh, different venues all operating at about the same time and into the night or what, what what's that because yeah. like? I, I think of the you know a lot of other festivals there's the leaf festival and other festivals that yeah that are like that but what is this going to be like yeah so it's it's not a traditional festival but we so it's in the spirit of a happening and the idea of a happening is that a lot of different things are happening all at once um from different disciplines um and they are happening, happening simultaneously, but independently and informing one another. So one example of that is we usually go from around three o'clock in the afternoon until you start trying to wind down around 10, people are usually hanging out for some time after that. Um, but you can just walk through the campus and encounter things. Um, you could walk into a room and suddenly be asked to be part of a performance. You could walk into a space and see someone uh, who's performing meditation with sound instrumentation. Um, you could walk into a Bouteau performance and all of this is happening at the same time so that as you go through your experience of that thing is going to be unique to you. Um, and so we have you know, designated performance times um, but a lot of things are durational or they're installations. Um, and we try to schedule it so that you can go see the Philip Glass Ensemble and have that time but also you could take several hours and wander through and just encounter things as they occur. You don't um, walk into a classroom and somebody says, please do a 10 minute speech on Philip Glass, do you? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what people propose. We have had some experimental lectures that are awesome. Um, so it's really, I mean, and sometimes what's fun is, you know, we get proposals from artists and we love an open-ended proposal um, as long as there's kind of like a good structure there. But most of the time, you know, we get there and we walk around and be like, 
oh my God, this isn't even what we imagined this would be. Um, so there's so many surprises and really fun things that happen. And it's just all about kind of giving the reins over to artists and trusting them and letting them do their thing, um, which is what Black Mountain was about. I was gonna say, so that's reminiscent of Black Mountain itself, but so there's a, there's a, you're scheduling things and people can, you know, look down and see what's going on here, but it's also, um, it's spontaneous is what mm -hmm. you're saying. So the ex experience that someone will have will be dictated by how um, luck and by, and by how open they are to experimenting is what you're saying. Absolutely. And artists will sometimes arrive and realize that, you know, on the other side of the hill is someone making this incredible music. And so that will impact the way that they're dancing. And, you know, there's an interplay happening between all of the artists that are there. Um, that's very sometimes improvisational, but I think very much in this kind of spirit of a happening where um, everything that's occurring is amplifying everything else. You're listening to uh, Kate Averett, Outreach Manager for Black Mountain uh, College Museum Art Center. We're talking about some of the really innovative things that they are doing and still do in the way they've connected uh, with the local community, the national community and the international community through um, in many ways, uh, the legacy of its former students and faculty and uh, people who have carried on some of those traditions uh, otherwise. So uh, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about, again, some of these other programs that don't take place around specific events, but ways in which uh, the museum uh, gets into the catalogs of other institutions and feeds into it and gets fed by it. T tell us a bit about th those sorts of things. Yeah, um, so we, we keep talking about social networks um, and the networks of Black Mountain College as it's represented across the world. Um, and of course that is representative with artists working today. It's representative with collections and exhibitions happening around the world. So um, pieces in our collection travel um, and are allowed to put in, are allowed to be put in context with other work. Um, we do the same here where we loan in work um, and Publishing is a big part of our mission as well. So we publish catalogs um, for our exhibitions. We also publish um, dossiers on Black Mountain College alums, um, as well as memoirs. Um, and so this is something that's continuing. And part of that is we have um, inherited the Jargon Society Press, which is a small independent press that was founded by Jonathan Williams, who was an alum of the college. Um, and that really was about unsung voices in poetry and photography and art. Um, and that's something that we are looking forward to engaging with again. Um, and so we have that aspect of things, but we also are excited to be able to invite curators and artists to come in and activate our archive. We have something we call Active Archive. Um, so we are able to invite artists in to say, you know, will you create a performance or, um, when you curate an exhibition uh, that is central to your influence by Black Mountain College, um, using our archive, using artworks, documents. Um, one example of that is uh, Martha McDonald, who was our first active archive resident. She was fascinated by performance and process of the college. And so she came in and curated an incredible exhibition from a permanent collection. Um, and at the same time, she went back and reimagined a somewhat lost performance from Black Mountain College that we have photographic documentation of, um, but of course there's no film of it. Um, so she went back and kind of reimagined spectrodrama and then performed it in the space in that exhibition. Um, and so there are these great opportunities to, again, make these connections between contemporary art and, uh, and our collection and what we do as far as preservation. Um, yeah, so, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it does, but um, still some things that are a little um, uh, mysterious to me. You, mm -hmm. you use the phrase active archive. So when I hear that, I think, well, archive means something that's located in the back room and you have to uh, push away the cobwebs and open a file drawer and get into it. Obviously, that's not what you're talking about. Active means something to me that you can experience. Um, and 
and knowing your space, you have uh, limited space, as you say, mm -hmm. to actually display. So, so then how do people, you know, access the, the treasure trove of art and dossiers and memorabilia, or you, I think it's referred to on the website as ephemera, mm -hmm. um, which means it's there, but it, <laughs> it might not be, it might not be there forever. How, how does one do that? Yeah, so the in the archival uh, in archival world of ephemera, it's kind of our catch-all term for like postcards and like incredible little treasures. Um, but yeah, we're so excited. We um, got a major grant to uh, digitize our. We've received several grants for towards digitization in the past, um, which have been incredibly helpful to us. Um, but we have just received uh, funding to essentially create a web portal um, that will allow for our entire collection to be available for researchers and artists and just anyone interested from across the world. And that includes artworks, our little treasures of ephemera, uh, furniture, um, as well as the oral histories that we've collected that have also been a huge aspect of what we do. Um, and that will also include contemporary performance and the programs that we've held over the last, you know, it'll be close to 30 years by the time that this is available. Um, and so being able to, as you mentioned, our, it's funny to think about our space being small because it's three times the amount of space we've ever had, but it is, it's relatively small. We have two gallery spaces, um, which we love and we're able to present different exhibitions related to Black Mountain. Um, but I think that we are trying to tell as many stories as we can. Um, and that means that not everything is on show at the, t at the same time. And of course, just when it comes to preservation, in order to keep things safe, they have to be, um, yes, held in these spaces where they're not viewable by the public. Um, and that's just how museums work. But thankfully, because of access to the internet and through these grants we're able to make those things available to anyone who's interested in seeing them and i hate to use this phrase but others have used it um fortunately um because of covid because there's not many fortunate things people are becoming used to virtual experiences mm -hmm. and not having to go to a specific um geographic place to experience it but nonetheless tap into it um so uh, i guess that's your sense of it as well yeah we've i mean our entire model changed under covid in so many ways because we wanted to make sure we were still supporting artists and that we were bringing art to people when they really needed it um and so we transitioned over to digital programming and started producing concerts and lecture series and short documentaries and um, really took on a whole kind of digital production wing um, that started during COVID and that we're going to continue doing because it allows people to attend concerts and engage with these artists in ways that we just didn't have the capacity to do before, but now out of necessity have found a way to do. And it's just, it is um, one of those things that has come out of COVID that I think a lot of people are just rethinking access and rethinking um, how we experience things so we're looking forward to kind of moving into that hybrid model of making things available and giving people the opportunity to sit in this space and experience things like that so i take it when you use the term art and then you talk about lectures and and we understand that black mountain was a liberal arts school and not just an art school you, you have an expansive view of what you mean by art it it could be an education about a, an idea or an architectural idea or even potentially a scientific idea? Is that yeah. embraced within that term? Absolutely. Yeah, I think we look at kind of interdisciplinary arts as a, as a starting point, but um, yeah, we're able to bring in architects, designers, scholars on people like Buck Webster Fuller, um, mathematicians to come in and you know, because again, thinking arts are central to Black Mountain College and arts are kind of a a way for us to understand our place in a lot of different principles. Um, I know I'm an art historian and math was never of interest to me. It was never something I thought I could understand until I'm able to see it through the perspective of someone who's an artist. Um, and I think it goes both ways. 
where there are so many artists at Black Mountain College who encountered people like Max Stain and then suddenly realized, oh, I could have been an architect or maybe I want to go into um, science. And it opens up so many possibilities for people. Um, so it's important to us, of course, we are an arts center. So performing arts, visual arts, music, um, dance, all of these things are central to what we do, but it's always within the larger context of, um, of education as a whole. So we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to focus on that for one second, mm -hmm. because in the beginning we talked about um, art being uh, critical to uh, the Bauhaus College and uh, Black Mountain College. So often today you still hear about if there's going to be a program cut, we're going to cut art, we're going to cut music, we're going to cut, you know, something else. But that actually sounds like it's the wrong way to look at things because art is not something that sits on the side and functions by itself. It's something that's integratable. And you know, every, everybody who's a great artist knows something about math or knows something about all that. So let me let you expound on that and then tell people, um, I want you to tell people how they can become involved um, yeah. with the museum. Yeah, I mean, I think the narrative that I was always taught um, studying history and studying art history specifically is that in order for a society to create art they have to be in a position where you know these hierarchy of needs are met and art is always the last thing on that list it's kind of listed under a luxury but then you look back through history and you see that naturally human beings relate to one another by the creation and um, experience of art cave drawing um, yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and so I think art is just our way of processing and understanding the world around us. It cannot be separated um, into a silo. Um, so I think Black Mountain is an incredible example of that where um, famously when Joseph Albers arrived at Black Mountain College, a student asked him, you know, what are you hoping to accomplish here? And in his very limited English, he said to open eyes. And that's kind of the principle that we look at for things is um, artwork allows for you to see the world differently and hopefully expands your worldview and expands um, your ability to understand other principles. Um, so I think from there, just as far as asking people to get involved, um, come down and see us if you can. Um, our gallery is fully open. Um, Again, we're a staff of four. Uh, we all love um, speaking with people when they come in um, and talking to you about your specific connection to this history, your specific interests. Um, we are still offering digital programs. Um, so all of those are available on our museum from home page uh, where everything is archived and will continue to be archived. Um, and again, looking ahead to the reviewing conference in the fall, um, we will be opening in September um, our exhibition, Don't Blame It on Zen, The Way of John Cage and Friends, which is going to be incredible um, representation of artists who were contemporaries of John Cage and also contemporary artists who were influenced by um, his studies in Zen Buddhism. Um, and as part of that, we'll be moving into our conference in the fall, which is completely open to the public. If you're not an academic, I really encourage you to still check it out. And it's actually free for students. So if there's any students listening, please drop by. Um, and so all of this um, can be found on our website, blackmountaincollege.org, and we're also very active on social media, um, specifically on Instagram and Facebook. Um, so give us a follow there, sign up for our newsletter, which is on the front page of our website, um, and just generally just reach out to us because we love finding ways to connect. Hey, Everett, Outreach Manager, Black Mountain College Museum Art Center. Wonderful program. Terrific having you on the show today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for my producer, uh, Shelly Lieberman from Focus Solutions. And love to get you back on the show because it's a fascinating interview. Thanks so much. Thank you.